Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. On this holy night, when we confront the cost of sin in all its starkness, let us have the same eagerness for cleansing as Peter, who 
when Jesus came to wash his feet, responded, not only my feet, Lord, but also my hands and my head. Let us pray together. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sin, and whose mercy we forget in the obscurity of our hearts. Take up the basin and the towel this holy night. Cleanse us, we beseech thee, from all our offenses, and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with lowliness and meekness we may draw near to thee, confessing our faults, confiding in thy grace, finding in thee our refuge and our strength for the morrow, through Jesus Christ our Lord. On this holy night when we confront the cost of love in all its starkness, let us turn our ears again to the good news of the gospel, that God so loved the world that he sent his only son not to condemn the world, but that we might be saved through him. Hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Beloved of God, before we join our hearts and voices together in prayer, that God will illumine the scriptures, revealing to us the sacred story of our Savior's acts of love, 
on the night of his arrest and betrayal. I remind us all of our common task as the word is read and we rehearse the events commemorated by the Lord's Supper. We begin with lighted candles this evening, knowing that the time will come for extinguishing them. As our Lord supped with his disciples and washed their feet, inching ever closer to the cross, he experienced betrayal, abandonment, and denial at the hands of his friends. On this night, we like to believe that we would have stayed awake with Jesus, that we never would have betrayed him as Judas did, that we certainly would not deny him as Peter did. We like to imagine ourselves instead among the women who stayed with Jesus until the end. And yet, in our daily lives, no matter how faithful we aim or strive to be, we fail to stay awake to the vast suffering of this world. Our neighbors die from violence and war, from hunger and homelessness and disease. And we betray and abandon them, even if only out of the sheer compassion fatigue that comes when the world's injuries seem to outnumber and outweigh our efforts to restore healing and freedom and peace. So as we retell the story of this night from the Gospel according to John, let us place ourselves in the narrative. At some point, when the story's deep sadness overwhelms you, when you know that you yourself might have fallen asleep, especially to the world's weighty grief, then blow out your candle. As the smoke rises from the light you have extinguished, remember this, tonight's story tells of a love that persists precisely when we least deserve it. Jesus knew Judas would betray him, yet, he fed Judas. Jesus foretold that Peter would deny him, yet he washed Peter's feet. So tonight, when the light of Jesus' life flickers out, as will be symbolized by the deepening darkness in this sanctuary, let this then be our prayer. Servant Savior, as you fed and cared for your disciples, and illumined the scriptures for them, so feed and care for us. So illumine your sacred story as we read your word and gather at your table. As you forgave those whom you loved, forgive us. As you changed them, change us. As you sent them into the world you so loved to break bread and share the cup with every child of the covenant, send us that we who are your servants may take up the basin and the towel. Amen. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, 
but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. For if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But it is to fulfill the scripture, the one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly I tell you, whoever receives one whom I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, very truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. 
After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, do quickly what you are going to do. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you too should love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, how can we know where you are going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my very life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times.
After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers, together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, For whom are you looking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, For whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken, I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest, that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the religious authorities that it was better to have one person die for the people.
One of my favorite things to do when I was an associate minister for Christian education in Philadelphia was to teach children about the faith we hope they will share. I loved to teach them about worship, about the stories of the Bible, and most of all about the love of a God who authors all of the stories of God's people from before creation to now and forever into eternity in every direction we can imagine even more. And I love children's questions. Oftentimes, as I was teaching, a child would interrupt to ask about my robe and my stole. Why do you dress up that way? I would explain that in different churches, pastors wear different kinds of clothing to lead worship, each with its own theological underpinnings. In the Presbyterian tradition, the black Geneva gowns we wear are the robes of the academy. They represent our tradition's commitment to maintaining a learned clergy. We do not allow just anyone to become a minister. Those who do must first study the Bible, often in its original languages. We must wrestle with theology and church history, learn the nuances of spiritual practice, prayer, and pastoral care. In order to become a pastor, Presbyterians must pass comprehensive examinations and vow to continue to serve God with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. And we as Presbyterians take that intelligence part quite seriously. Since pride isn't exactly a Calvinist virtue, let me simply say that we are well pleased to wear the mantle of loving God with our whole minds. Ah, but you see, to know about God is not the same as to know God. Nor does learning all the academy has to offer place a call to serve God's people on a pastor's heart. To love God, to love God's people cannot be taught. Rather, loving God and loving our neighbors must originate from God's word and from within our own hearts as the word of God is revealed to us. The word has to take on flesh again in order to live. It cannot remain simply ink on the page or notes in a notebook or on any test. We are to take God's word into our very selves. It feeds us and nourishes our souls until we learn to love better. This is something we cannot simply agree to on a purely cognitive level. Some of you grew up in traditions that are not Presbyterian, that are much more comfortable with loving God with your whole body, your whole self, with your voice and your muscles and your bones. I've attended worship services in Sochi, Malawi, and in Camden and Trenton, New Jersey, alike, wherein dancing before the Lord, as King David once did, is commonplace, and the call and response chorus of amens nearly drowns out the preacher. Presbyterians, on the other hand, say amen by taking notes. And to tell the truth, as a preacher, I am much more accustomed to receiving only the faintest mm as an affirmation of something I've said from the pulpit. Now don't get me wrong, in this space we value the quiet dignity of a traditional reformed worship service, and as long as I am here, that is as it shall ever be. We sing full-voiced the hymns of the ages and revel in the notes of Mozart and Bach, Palestrina and Talus. And this is authentic to our community of faith and to the ways we express ourselves in praise. But that doesn't mean we cannot learn from our siblings in the faith who are somewhat less inhibited regarding the bodies God has given us. On Monday, Thursday, 
Jesus reminds his disciples that faith is not always found at the end of greater or deeper intellectual understanding, but rather at eye level with dirty feet. Like Peter, we as Presbyterians at first might be inclined to withdraw from our Lord's insistence on washing our feet. We prefer our view of our God to be one that is lifted high, transfigured before us, reigning over earth and heaven as depicted in a mosaic that shimmers with otherworldliness in the candlelight. But the candlelight of this particular night, this Maundy Thursday, reveals a God who loved us on bended knee. It shows us that Jesus is as interested in our loving God with flesh and bone as much as he is interested in our loving God with hearts and souls and Presbyterian minds. You see, the robes we wear as Presbyterian clergy are a sign of the academy and the importance of the rigorous study of God and God's word and God's ways. But the stoles, well, the stoles represent the towel that Jesus tied around himself and used to wash the disciples' dirty feet. The stoles we wear remind us that Jesus hunched his own body before all of us who are made of dust, who have our share of caked on dirt that can only be washed clean by him. Until we rehearsed tonight's readings in this sanctuary, I had not remembered the paradoxical combination of tenderness and power with which Jesus washes his disciples' human feet and feeds their human hunger with bread and wine. Notice tonight that even though Jesus has all the foreknowledge of Judas' betrayal and Peter's denial, he tends to their bodies nonetheless with care and compassion. His care is not conditional on his disciples' ability to understand, nor is it dependent on their loyalty. While he names the injuries that his beloved disciples will inflict upon his own body and soul, Jesus does not enact vengeance. He does not leave them out of the incarnate love that is a part of who he is. He could have withheld the sacraments. The church throughout its history has often and errantly done so in Jesus' name. But instead, Jesus trusts that God's will and not his own should be done. And then in the meanwhile, he is called to wash feet and to share bread and to let God sort out the rest. Dear friends, on this Maundy Thursday, as we lean ever more closely to Good Friday, Here is the good news. In order to follow the example of our servant Savior, we cannot only know about God, but must also know God by conforming to the body of Christ, who is our surest sign that no matter how deeply we betray or how fervently we deny or how quickly we fall asleep in the face of suffering to which God begs us to keep awake. Our God takes on flesh to wash us. Our God takes on flesh to feed us, to love us still, body and soul. May we, too, pray to this God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And in order to participate in the coming of that kingdom and the fulfillment of God's divine will, may we take up the basin and the towel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing out at the gate. 
So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing round it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about the disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews came together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed.
Beloved of God, as our Lord once invited his dearest disciples, his friends, to remember him at table by caring for their needs and sharing the bread of heaven and the cup of salvation, so too our Lord invites us and all who trust him to share this feast which he has prepared. We come to this table not as perfect disciples of Jesus, but as those who have tried to follow and those who have failed. And yet the invitation remains the same, to come, to be washed clean, to be gathered together as one with all the saints who are imperfect beloved disciples all, to be nourished by the life of our servant Savior, who loves us still. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy and gracious God, creator of this world and all that is to come, we give thanks for your mighty acts of mercy, for you brought creation out of chaos, light out of darkness. You formed us in your image from the dust of the earth and breathed into us the breath of life. You gave your people freedom in the parting of the sea and marked them for life with the blood of the lamb. Even when our love failed, you have remained steadfast loving us and redeeming us in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. In Jesus, you laid aside the robe of your majesty and knelt among your children, facing humiliation and rejection. In his agony in the garden and suffering on the cross, you showed the world the extent of your love and your longing to bring us home into your presence. When the snares of death encompassed him, you swallowed up death in victory, that life and love might reign. Self-giving God, in Jesus you became the lamb who takes away the sins of the world and the living bread broken for the life of your children. Come among us in the power of your Holy Spirit that your people, as fragile and fitful as your disciples, may become your temple, and that these gifts of bread and wine may be for us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. As you have delivered our souls from death, our eyes from tears, our feet from stumbling, nourish us in this meal to walk before you in the land of the living and to keep faith in the face of suffering, violence, and injustice for you have already borne all of these for our sake and the sake of the world. What then shall we return to you, O Lord, for all your bounty to us? We will lift up the cup of salvation and call on your name. We will pay our vows to you in the presence of all people, offering thanksgiving and praise as a holy and living sacrifice that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen until that day when we will share this feast with all of creation in your kingdom, where you, in the presence of Christ and the companionship of the Holy Spirit, are all in all, one God now and forever. Amen. On the night of betrayal and arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup, and said, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. 
And as the Apostle Paul reminds us, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of our risen Savior until he comes again. Come, our Lord has made all things ready.
Let us pray. God of grace, we give you thanks for the feast of redemption we have shared in the body and the blood of our Savior. As you have nourished us with your love, let us live lives to proclaim your great love that is for the whole world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And Lord, hear us now as we join our voices in the prayer our Lord taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the judgment, that the light of Christ came into the world, and we knew it not. <laughs> 